already a couple of minutes in and I think the participants have slowed down being added. So we'll get underway, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to tonight's event. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to uh, moderate and welcome everyone tonight to the Battle for Aphrodite. Uh, before we get started, um, I'd just like to make my mouse work. There we go. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional um, owners of the land that we're all coming in from today. I live and work on the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, uh, in, which is in modern Sydney. Um, everyone today I know is joining us from all different parts of Australia, including um, our adjudicator Amelia in Queensland. And we'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and um, emerging on all of the lands that we come from today. For those who are not um, Australian or, or haven't really attended lectures in Australia, this is something that we do at the beginning of all of our lectures. Um, Australia is obviously a colonial, uh, a, a colonial kind of nation, um, and we all kind of come from different lands that uh, were have been lived on for millennia. And it's really important that as we are historians and lovers of history, that we acknowledge that history particularly that we are on today. Um, so tonight, I am very excited to be able to bring the very first of the Chow Chak Wing Museum and Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens Great Debates. Uh, tonight, our two contenders are Dr. Lita um, Gregory, sorry, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Craig Barker. Uh, Lita is a, the Executive Officer for the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens, as well as the Co-Director of the Australasian Paleocora Kithara Survey. I apologise if I butchered the name of the site leader. And we've got Craig, who is the director of the Papos Theatre Excavations run by the University of Sydney since 1995. And both of these um, debaters tonight come with expertise on their particular island and, and a great love for each of their islands. So I'm very excited to see how they claim the battle for Aphrodite as the birthplace of Afri each of their islands as the birthplace of this fabulous goddess. We also welcome tonight Dr. Amelia Brown, who will be our official adjudicator. Amelia is a specialist in uh, Greek and Roman archaeology. She is one of the key directors and excavators at the site of uh, Corinth. Um, but Amelia does have a passion for this goddess as well, working on the maritime sites of Aphrodite and has been even working on some of the sculptures and collections around Australia that include sculptures and material from Aphrodite. So no one could be better than to be our adjudicator tonight than Amelia. So the way that tonight's going to work is that we have uh, two sites uh, to battle. We have four different sections. Both Lita and Craig will be welcome to give us their general introduction to their goddess and why their island is the rightful birthplace of the goddess. They then will each have five minutes each to go through um, some archaeological artifacts, sites, and the legacy of Aphrodite on each of their respective islands. And at the end of the evening, we'll have Amelia give us her expert opinion as to who has come out supreme in this battle. But we will also have a poll in which you will be able to vote at the very end. So at the very end, I'll open up the poll and you'll all get to cast your vote for who you think is the rightful birthplace of Aphrodite. So earlier today, um, I did flip a coin, a virtual coin uh, via Google. Uh, heads was Kithara, tails was Cyprus, and it came up heads. So Lita will be going first in each of our rounds today. Um, because we're share screen sharing and doing this remotely, I'm actually going to be controlling the slides. Uh, so both Lita and Craig will be tapping or telling me next uh, to move on to the next slide. So I hope you all bear with us on that one. So welcome tonight to the debate. You've got the chat function that hopefully we will have it open throughout. Um, and if you need anything, pop a message in there and I'll hopefully see it. Otherwise, let's get underway. So, okay. Lena, you are up first. Open the All argument. Right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, okay, I begin. Aphrodite's origins and the circumstances of her unusual birth have been a topic of scholarly interest and debate ever since antiquity. Next. While her worship was widespread throughout the Greco-Roman world with important cults developed on the mainland of Greece, Greece. Next. Probably the most famous one in Corinth with its alleged 1000 temple prostitutes, as well as throughout Northern Greece, Asia Minor and Magna Graecia, two islands in the Eastern Mediterranean lay equal claim to being Aphrodite's birthplace. Next. 
Cyprus and Kithira. After all, amongst the many epithets, next, the goddess is referred to in the ancient text inter interchangeably as either Kypria, Kyprogenis, next, uh, or Kytheria. Next, given that the early literary sources are scant and contradictory, next, while the archaeological evidence is rather limited in offering any tangible answers to the questions of Aphrodite's origins, we can't help but find ourselves crossing a fine line between truth and fiction, interpretation and speculation, illusion and fantasy, myth and reality. Next. Therefore, in defending Kithira as the birthplace of Aphrodite, I will have to rely primar primarily on circumstantial evidence, while at the same time acknowledging the complexity of the topic debated here today. Next. For Aphrodite is not a simple goddess that can be easily identified and understood. Like most of the ancient Greek gods, she's complex and multifaceted, but she's also unique, which makes her even harder to conceptualize. While Homeric tradition refers to her as the daughter of Zeus and Dione, the more popular version of her birth, as relayed by Hesiod in his Theogony, wants her born as a full-grown adult from the foam that resulted when the castrated genitals of Uranos fell into the sea. Next. This version casts her of special importance as the only Olympian god that predates even Zeus in this primordial capacity. She's not simply the goddess of love and beauty, but a personification of all the emotions, ideals, and sensory experiences, many of them extreme, that are associated with these conditions and cannot be separated or ignored. Love that can easily turn to hatred, sparked by jealousy and vengeance, beauty that can destroy others and self-destruct, and beauty that can be found even in small and insignificant things, alongside the harsh realities of warfare and the constant struggle for daily survival. Aphrodite embodies all these and more, lust, sex, marriage, fertility, infidelity are part of her real, as is seafaring, civic order, even war. One could certainly ask, is she even one god or does she represent different gods in a single persona? And which Aphrodite are we arguing for here today? By focusing on only some aspects of hers, which is what we can only do in such a short time, are we doing her justice? The scope of this debate does not allow us to address these important questions adequately. Instead, I will attempt to demonstrate the undoubtedly special connection of Aphrodite to the island of Kithira, as best as we can understand such a connection today, given the limited evidence at hand, and as best we think that our ancient ancestors perceived it. Kithira is synonymous with Aphrodite, referred to in the ancient texts as Zathea, most holy, next. The island's identity is intertwined with the goddess of love and particularly with her manifestation as Urania Aphrodite, celestial Aphrodite, next. According to Plato, Urania, as opposed to Pandemos, the popular or common Aphrodite, was the primordial manifestation of the goddess closely identified with the earth, procreation, military power, and a masculine femininity, and was frequently depicted armed and represented by a non-iconic cult object or statue. She was also known as Kytheria. The island's name Kythira has ancient roots, mentioned by ancient writers such as Homer, Herodotus, Dionysus, and Xenophon, the latter referring to the land as Kytheria Yi, land of the Kytheria. Next. What is uncertain, uh, why, sorry, while it is uncertain as to what the exact meaning of the name is, it has been argued that it is etymologically connected to the Greek verb kefto, which means I hide, and therefore Kythira, the hidden place. Thus it can be argued that Aphrodite as Kytheria Aphrodite identifies herself with the island as a place of hidden love. Next. The adjective akithiros, on the other hand, is synonymous with anaphroditos, meaning one who is lacking in sexual charms. The first century AD geographer, Isidore of Parax, 
supported the view that the island took its name from Aphrodite Kytheria and not the other way around. Next, this may be a chicken and egg kind of debate, but regardless, regardless of what came first, the island or the goddess, one cannot doubt their strong connection and the perception than what, that one could not exist without the other. All throughout antiquity, the Middle Ages, and into the modern periods up to the present day, the island's identity is defined through its connection with Aphrodite, capturing the minds and hearts of foreign travelers seeking pilgrimage to the island of love. But why Kithira? The answer to this complex question may in fact be simple. Geography. Next. Kithira is a land of contrasts and opposites, neither large nor small. It is a medium-sized island, approximate, approximately 280 square kilometers, making it 17th in size of all the Greek islands. Next. Most of the island is mountainous and extremely rugged with difficult access between the few natural harbors and the interior. A beautiful and yet wild landscape with only a few areas of flat land its inhabitants have always struggled with nature to tame the landscape and make it productive. The centuries-long man-nature struggle is evident in the numerous terraces and field walls that abound the island and which now are largely abandoned and overgrown due to outward migration and depopulation since the early 20th century. The antithesis between its harsh, wild, rugged, but at the same time naturally beautiful and serene landscape reflects precisely the different and varying moods of the goddess. Just like Aphrodite, both lovely and awful, the land of Kithira is both a blessing and a hindrance, lovely for the romantic nature-loving visitor and awful for the year-long inhabitants who must constantly struggle to maintain their fields and keep them sus sus sustainable. And so while life on the island has always been a matter of survival for the local inhabitants, Kithira's extraordinary position in the Mediterranean has contributed to it being contested territory by almost every civilization in want of control of the region. Because one of its most important characteristics is its location midway between the Peloponnesus and Crete and astride some of the most important sea lanes in the Eastern Mediterranean. Its potential for control of access to the mainland by sea and of these sea lanes themselves has given it significant strategic importance in virtually all historical periods. Ancient writers acknowledge this geographical importance, which may explain the view that Aphrodite's worship was not by chance and that it evolved from an earlier, more ancient tradition with a possible Near Eastern origin debatable as to whether from Mesopotamia, Syria, Egypt, or Asia Minor. Next. The standard argument is for a possible relationship between the more primitive Aphrodite and Near Eastern goddesses, such as Astarte, Ishtar, and or Sibylle, brought from across the seas to Kithira on the main trading routes between East and West. Herodotus claims that the oldest temple of Aphrodite Urania was at Ascalon in Syria and that her worship was brought from there to Cyprus while the Phoenicians from Syria founded the temple of Aphrodite on Kithira. Pausanias, many centuries later, says that her worship began in Assyrian Mesopotamia and from there spread to Paphos and then to Syria where the Phoenicians then brought her to Kithira. But he also contradicts himself when elsewhere he claims that her sanctuary in Kithira is the most holy and the most ancient of all the sanctuaries of Aphrodite among the Greeks. Next, contradictions aside, knowledge of the worship of Aphrodite on Kithira was commonplace throughout antiquity. And this early fourth century AD Roman mosaic at Amadara, south of Carthage in modern day Tunisia is a convincing testament. Next, known as the island's mosaic, it represents islands and cities of the Mediterranean Sea with major sanctuaries of the goddess. Not surprising, Kithira is shown right next to Paphos. Even if one questions the theory of Eastern influences, it is hard not to imagine that worship of a primordial female deity may have developed on the island of Kithira independently. Next, for example, Archaeological discoveries at the Minoan peak sanctuary of Agus Iorios of Mino point to the worship of an unknown female deity, possibly connected to fertility and Mother Earth. 
Could this deity be one possible predecessor of Aphrodite? If so, was there a period of interaction between these two deities and their cults? Did one replace the other or did one gradually morph into the other? Next. Answers to these questions are not easy to come by, if not impossible, given that we are dealing with prehistory and thus the absence of written evidence. Speculations may be plentiful, but one thing is for certain, Aphrodite did make it to Kithira one way or another. And since at least the eighth century BC, the island and the goddess have been inseparable up to the present day. That's it. Wonderful. All right, Craig, you're up for your opening remarks, please. Thank you very much. Um, first slide, please. Thank you. So um, building upon Lita's opening comments, and actually, sorry, before I begin, I should mention that I'm coming to you from the Chow Chak Wing Museum, and again, on Gadigal land as well. It's uh, lovely to join us this evening. But uh, uh, building upon leaders' opening remarks, and in terms of much of that complexity, I am in total agreement. But I, what I want us to do is to focus a little more towards the east of the Mediterranean. And I think that that geographical location of Cyprus as the easternmost island is perhaps pivotal in terms of our understanding of the relationship of uh, the historical development of the worship of the goddess on the island and the reason for Cyprus's claim as the birthplace. For, uh, next slide, please, moderator. Of course, uh, if we're going to be talking geographical locations, then it is this particular uh, site on the southwest coast of Cyprus, uh, the uh, uh, so-called Rock of Aphrodite or Petro to Romeo, that has been long argued in various historical sources and according to local customs as the birthplace of Aphrodite. Now, it's worthwhile bearing in mind that right across the island, there are shrines and sanctuaries in various points of antiquity dedicated to the goddess. But today, I'm going to be focusing on the Paphos region in particular of, uh, of southwestern coast of the island, and in particular, focusing on the ancient sanctuary site at Paleopaphos, or the uh, modern village of Puklia, and the Hellenistic and Roman uh, settlement uh, around the natural harbour of Neopaphos or modern Cartopaphos, where the University of Sydney has been excavating for the past 25 years, as Candice mentioned. Petro to Romeo is located very close to the sanctuary at Paleopaphos and uh, a, a mere 16 kilometres away from New Paphos as well. And this unusual geological and geographical formation is really at the centre of Cyprus's claims. As most of us are aware, according to the myth, Aphrodite was born in the foaming waters around the fragments of the rocks. Um, when Gaia, or Mother Earth, asked one of her sons, Kronos, to mutilate his father, Uranus, or the sky, Kronos cuts off Uranus's testicles and threw them into the sea. According to the local version of the myth, it's in the foams of that uh, 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 body parts that uh, the goddess is born born fully formed and walking on to the beach as we see it here. And the unusual geographical location of uh, Petra to Romeo really lends to the story. According to local tradition, indeed part of the rocks is the lower waist of Uranus and uh, the, uh, where, where Kronos has actually cut him in half using a scythe. And as he tries to escape flying, losing part of his truncated body and his testicles into the sea. The white foam is therefore formed where the maiden will rise and walk onto the beach. Taking her to Cyprus, then to Kifara, and then returning to Cyprus from where she will meet the assembly of the gods. Now, interestingly, and I think coming from Australia with a First Nations perspective of understanding storytelling with geographical location, what is interesting is just how unusual this particular stretch of the coastline is in comparison with much of the rest of the southern coast of the island of Cyprus. In all the times I've been there, I've never seen or heard any birds, interestingly. And it is, of course, uh, a result of the formation of the meeting of the African continental plate with the European continental plate, where you do get some very unusual geographical, uh, uh, sorry, geological formations across the island of Cyprus, but in this coastline in particular. There is something otherworldly about it. And if we are going to be exploring the notions of the development of mythology 
uh, in relationship with landscape, this is a prime piece of real estate. Now, it is said that Aphrodite's rock itself is the one furthest out from the formations of the rock. And there are various local legends associated with it. One is said that in certain weather conditions, the waves will actually rise and break, forming a column of water that will dissolve into pillars of foam. With a little bit of imagination, this will momentarily look like an ephemeral human shape. Other popular myths over the past centuries will tell you that if you swim around the rock three times, uh, you will have, according to various versions of it, blessings, eternal youth and beauty, good luck, fertility, or what the, the person you dream of that night will be your one true love. Now, I must say, I've only ever swum it once myself. Um, despite its beauty, the waves, the waves can be rather rough at times, but what's interesting, and can I have the next slide, please, is that uh, 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 the rock that you'll see furthest to the uh, right in this image is the one you swim around. Um, I've uh, spoken about this a number of times in public lectures where I've often joked that I dreamt of cheese that night. But for the first time ever, I'm going to actually acknowledge that I did actually have a dream that night of someone who was uh, the object of my affections. So it's interesting to note from a personal experience, this is not scientific in any way, shape or form, that perhaps there is a grain of truth to these urban or, or, or rural legends of time. Interestingly, next slide, please. Sorry, I just went to <laughs> move them on myself. Um, upon being born, Aphrodite, of course, then uh, uh, bathed herself in a, uh, a, a, a waterfall near Polis on the north of the island before going to Mount Olympus, according to the myth. But her cult base was going to be located at Paleopathos with the development over time of the sanctuary. Now, next slide. Now, as we've seen um, in Lita's presentation, that there are, of course, numerous ancient historical sources that refer to both Cyprus and Kithra. I showed the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, describing the golden Aphrodite as the one from Cyprus. Uh, what I've cheekily done is admit the very next sentence, which then refers to Kithra as well. And I, it's worthwhile bearing in mind that, of course, many of the complexities that we're going to be discussing today were well known in ancient historical sources, as Lita has already outlined. But the recognition by Greek writers of the role of Paphos in the Aphrodite story is well attested from a very early date. Paphos and Aphrodite are mentioned in association in the Odyssey, for example, in Book 8, 362. Um, we're also told by later sources such as Pausanias of the importance of the cult sanctuary around Paleopathos, and in particular of the pilgrims route between Neopathos and Paleopathos um, that I'm gonna be focusing on later on from its Roman perspective as well. We're also told by other sources and later sources such as Tacitus of the significance of that sanctuary site because of its role in the foundation story of Aphrodite. Next slide, please. That Aphrodite was venerated at the wave lap shrine of Paphos. And very close to uh, Petra to Romeo was the site of the sanctuary of Aphrodite. Now World Heritage listed, the 32 hectares of the site was excavated um, in the uh, late 19th century, and then again more recently by the University of Zurich under the direction of the late Franz Meyer in the 1970s, 1990s, and in one last season in 2007 and 2008. The sanctuary site itself, I'll come to in a moment, but what's worthwhile bearing in mind is the Eastern influence. As we've already heard from Lita, Astarte's role in terms of Phoenician spread and because of Cyprus's important role on trade and communication networks between East and West, the influence between uh, Middle Eastern worship and developments on the island are significant. It's probably likely that Aphrodite in the very earliest form in Cyprus took the part of a local fertility goddess of some sort who would gradually take on the form of, or aspects of the form of of uh, Astarte and of other Eastern influences. This figure has been variously described as the Cyprus goddess. 
And the late Jacqueline Cariogas, who is one of the great scholars of the role of uh, Aphrodite on the island, argued, I feel quite convincingly, that we have a local custom influenced by Middle Eastern uh, traditions and that the gradual Hellenization of the goddess over centuries on Cyprus takes place until the fourth century AD where she takes her fully realized form as we would know her today in the Hellenistic and Roman period, as we shall see very, very soon in a number of marble uh, sculptures of the goddess. Next slide, please, Candice. I'm Thank about to run out of time, I don't. Um, the site itself uh, uh, is uh, uh, continuously used according to archeological investigations for more than 1,500 years. The Temenos of the, what will become the Panhellenic Sanctuary of Aphrodite um, has a very, very early date. And we know that there is a, a, a late Bronze Age period shrine um, built in about uh, 1,200 BC in a plan which is typical Near Eastern with a court sanctuary typical to other contemporary sites on the, on the island, such as Mertu Pigardi's. Female figurines and charms found in the, been, uh, uh, in the close location of the site dating from the early third millennium BC through to late Roman periods are indicative of the relationship. And we will see um, both uh, Bronze Age and Roman significant architecture of the shrine itself. The photograph we just had before, by the way, of David Hogarth, who excavated on behalf of the Cyprus Ex Exploration Fund in 1888, representing the very first scientific excavations. Although a lovely quote from Hogarth, uh, a reminder that scientific excavations of the 19th century are not what we would expect today. I knew nothing of the, digging, of the digger's art at the beginning and very little of it at the end of the project. The photograph that we saw before was published in 1896. The nearby modern village of Kukbia is derived from the word kuklis, meaning dolls, and probably because of that significant number of female figures. There is a long tradition, as we shall see in the next slide, of the depictions of female uh, figures that have a relationship with Aphrodite on the island. And in our final slide of my opening marks, remarks, we will see that by the Hellenistic and Roman period, we see Aphrodite in the form of which we know her, in the form of statues excavated from Neopapos, from Solai on the north coast of the island, and one that I've not put a slide of, but a statue that was dredged from Paphos Harbour. Wonderful, thank you, Craig. All right, Lady, you're up five minutes to discuss the topic of artifacts. Okay. Well, surprisingly, there are very few artifacts relating to Aphrodite found on Kithira itself. Uh, initially, I thought of choosing a first century BC coin produced on the island, showing on the one side the head of Aphrodite and on the reverse her emblematic dove. Perhaps the fragment of a marble statuette of the goddess semi-naked, also dated to the first century. Next slide. Instead, I decided on an object that is not so ancient found outside of Kithira, but one that is directly related to the island and its goddess. The Royam d'Amour, or Kingdom of Love, is part imaginary map, map, part Veduta or cityscape, and part board game, and was created by Tristan Rehamit and Jean Sadler in 1650. It is an example of a special category of cartography that involved the mapping of imaginary worlds and journeys that developed as early as the Middle Ages and continued to be popular during the Renaissance. Next, some famous examples include maps of Dante's Inferno, showing the nine circles of hell through which Dante traveled, and maps showing the pilgrimage from London to Canterbury, inspired by Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Next, the Royaume d'Amour is a fine example of an allegorical map that describes the main cities, villages, and sites of the Kingdom of Love on the island of Kithira. The map is also a game where the players, both male and female, are pilgrims on a journey of love, navigating a set course through the different parts of the kingdom. At the bottom, next to a town view, an erotic scene pictures the banquet of love. Despite this view, however, the game imposes forms of control and containment on the amorous terrain. 
The realm of love is the whole of the island of Kithira. And in search of love, one must circle, in front, must, circle, must circle the island from the plane of indifference to amorous gazing and panting, all the way to declaration and satisfaction. Here, the course of the journey becomes a circuitous path and cartographic repetition becomes the key to a mastery of sentiments. Next. Throughout the map, Aphrodite and Eros, um, sorry, if you can go back and the slide back, please. Oh yes, okay. So you can see Aphrodite and Eros are depicted, no, that's okay, you can go forward again, um, are depicted either together or on their own. So one can imagine the game being played in French salons and even in the court of Louis XIV in Versailles. Kithira seems to have been a popular theme for games of this type, next, which are variants of the Zendelois, game of the goose, a game of chance dating back to the late 16th century, similar to snakes and ladders. Next, like the Roan d'Amour, the game of a voyage to the Isle of Kithira from 1780 also visualizes the romantic landscape as a treacherous seascape. Each player must sail the seas encountering obstacles along their way, such as shipwrecks and temples of jealousy, and Aphrodite himself in order to arrive at the final square, which is the island of Kithira. The first square of the game shows a group of male and female figures boarding their ship. Next, the inspiration for these games may be found in the Renaissance, in works of art, such as Botticelli's Birth of Venus, and this marvelous woodcut illustration. Next, please. Um, and I'm sorry about the poor image. I really could not find a better uh, image to show you here. Um, this woodcut illustration published in Venice by Francesco Colonna in his Hypnerotomachia Polyphili, The Strife of Love in a Dream. It shows a plan of Kithira as a destination for lovers with the island subdivided into sectors of equal size, intersected by rows of colonnades and hedges. 20 paths laid out according to Renaissance principles of perspective and with their measurements given in the text converge on an inner circle. Here at the center and concealed by a sacred structure, the fountain of Venus is located. The entire design sets the context for a ritualized wedding the ceremonial crux of which is the moment when the veil in the Venus temple is pulled, signifying the defloration of the bride. Next. The subject, of, okay, the subject of the journey to Kithira was made popular in the 18th century with a painting by the French artist Antoine, Antoine Vatot, pilgrimage to the island of Kithira. Totally imaginary, the lush landscape is idyllic and infused with bright blue skies, soft green leaves and warm brown earth. So Kithira's mysterious symbolism and allegory of the landscape in relation to the myth of Aphrodite has captured Western imagination in the literature and art, at least since the Renaissance period, influenced by ideological and philosophical movements and Platonism. Thus, Kithira is transformed from a real physical place into an intellectual landscape, symbolizing an idyllic, ideal, utopian, and nostalgic world and a mythical journey in search of Aphrodite. Done. <laughs> Brilliant. Over to you, Craig. Thank you very much. Um, I have chosen as an artifact to illustrate the point. Um, I can think of nothing better than the gift from the goddess herself. This black, although in reality it's actually dark green, stone, the conical stone, now on display in the Paleopapos Museum at Kupia, although for a number of decades it was in the Cyprus Museum in Nicosia. The stone itself is 122 centimetres high, and it is what's called a batel, uh, a rough shaped stone, um, often a meteorite or a, 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 a stone of a unique uh, a, a geographical formation from the area in which it is being displayed that held um, sacred uh, connections or was worshipped as something of divine origin in antiquity commonly known from the Middle East, um, but this is perhaps the most famous example from the Greco-Roman world. The stone itself would have been placed originally in the sacred uh, simul uh, simulacrum in the center of the temple. And we interestingly have a description of it. And if I can have the next slide, please, thank you. 
Um, we actually have a description of it from Tacitus' Tacitus's history, book two, three. It is forbidden to pour blood on the altar, Tacitus wrote, of the temple of Aphrodite or uh, of uh, uh, Aphrodite Paphia. The place of sac uh, sacrifice is served only with prayers and pure flame. And though it stands in the open air, it is never wet with rain. The image of the goddess does not bear a human shape. It is a rounded mass rising like a cone from a broad, broad base to a small circumference. This is sometimes translated by modern scholars as a description of a meta or a turning post in a Roman circus. And I think we can all agree that the general shape is rather similar. Tacitus goes on to describe that the meaning of the object or the reason for the object is doubtful or obscured, depending upon which translation you read. But we have an interesting scenario here where we have a very accurate description of an object that we can see for ourselves today in the 21st century. Yet even ancient sources being a little bit confused as to its origin, um, its functionality, and, and indeed its relationship with Aphrodite. Some ancient sources refer to it as an abstract formation of the goddess herself. And if you think back to the uh, classic uh, Hellenistic and Roman marble forms of the contraposto female form that I showed you in my very last slide in the opening remarks, this is not the goddess of love and beauty that we see. But it also demonstrates perhaps some of that long antiquity that Cyprus has associated with the goddess itself. It is obviously semi-pyramidal uh, in shape, a monolith of local garbo stone, a type of basalt. It was once speculated that the stone itself was a meteorite, but it's not. But it is undoubtedly volcanic in origin, and it is a, it is a basalt object. Very highly polished, probably likely due to continuous ointments and manual smoothing. Um, and as a result, it does correspond in shape to Tacitus' description. We'll probably never know for certain if it is uh, sacred stone, but the relationship between the object and that description by Tacitus, to me, seems very, very convincing. The stone itself was found in 1888 by Hogarth's team in the Western Stoa. So actually, whilst not in situ, certainly within a very close location to where it must have been originally placed. Hogarth described it in his publication and indeed his diaries, which unfortunately have subsequently been lost, as a curious triangular stone of a hard greenish material. It looks as if it may have been the base of a tripod. It had been inserted upside down in a late mosaic floor and probably inserted there in the medieval period. Thank you very much. Um, in 1913, John Myers, the British archeologist who was instrumental in the foundation of the Cyprus Museum, found it embedded in the courtyard wall of the first house on the left of the road, as he described it, um, the reuse of the stone that had already been reused. But he was the first to identify it as possibly being the sacred stone. And he actually thought that the 1888 excavators had missed it. It was not until 1975 that Franz Meyer put the story together. Next slide, please. Where I want to mention is how significant this is in later, particularly Roman imagery. It is impossible to think of the Roman uh, version of the temple of Aphrodite Paphia without thinking of this stone, this sacred stone, demonstrable in coinage minted on the island from Vespasian through to the Severan dynasty. And in particular, the coins of Titus, the only Roman emperor we know to have visited the stone. And final slide, please, Candice. Thank you very much. Um, instrumental in uh, particularly the imagery of the coins of the Severan. And I show you a coin excavated from the Paphos Theatre in 2001 of Caracalla of the beginning of the third century AD, in which we see that same stone now on display in the museum, the stone of Aphrodite herself. Wonderful. All right, Lady, you're up next. And our next topic is five minutes on sites. Okay. Well, unlike Cyprus, despite the obvious importance given to Kithira in the ancient texts in relation to the worship of Aphrodite, no temple of the goddess has ever been found. Even though arguably the whole island was regarded as sacred to the goddess and all holy, Zathea Kithira, it is surprising that to date not even a single relic of her worship a shrine, an altar, or a votive, let alone a temple, has ever been discovered. And it certainly isn't because of lack of trying. 
In fact, early explorers and travelers to the island all came in search of the famous Temple of Aphrodite. Uh, next. Re recent archaeological explorations at the site of Payocastro, the fortified archaic and classical city of Kitira, have revealed traces of a temple, alas, not of Aphrodite, but of Athena. Next. The passage provided by Pausanias claims that Aphrodite's temple on Kithira was the oldest in Greece and that the wooden statue depicted her as armed. It is quite unlikely that he actually saw the temple himself and that he's simply reiterating a centuries long tradition of Aphrodite's worship on the island. So did a temple dedicated to Aphrodite really exist? The answer is most likely yes, but why has it not been found? It could be that we have been looking in the wrong places or that it was constructed of wood and there are no physical remains of it. Or as the archeologist Aris Sarabopoulos argues, the place to look for it is at the bottom of the sea after part of the coastline collapsed in one or more earthquake events. Next, Pausanias refers to the temple in a short paragraph in which he talks about Skanda, the harbor town, and then the city of Kithira at modern Payokastro. So we cannot derive any precise geogra geographical information from it. These two sites are where most archeological research has been carried out since the 19th century and especially the 20th century. Next. The excavations at Payopoli between 1963 and 1965 by Cold Spring and Huxley provide the most important archeological information on the prehistoric and later phases of occupation and activity in the area while continuing investigations at Paleocastro, by Ioannis Petrochilos, have produced important information about the ancient city from the early Iron Age, archaic and classical periods. Next, the city was located on the plateau of a mountain of which the north, west and east parts were inaccessible and only the southern part sloped more easily into the valley, which was fortified with strong walls to create an impregnable fortified citadel. Next. It was a typical Greek polis with the agora in the middle part and an acropolis where recently a temple dedicated to Athena has been found. Most of the archeological interest in Payokastro has resulted from the belief that the famous temple of Aphrodite Urania was located here. Although as mentioned earlier, the ancient texts provide no geographical information as to where exactly it was other than in the city of Kithira. Early travelers to the site suggested that the temple must be located in Payokastro based on ancient ruins that they had witnessed on the site. Next, explorations culminated in 1887 with a visit to Kithira of Henry Schliemann, who having read the accounts of other visitors to Payokastro concluded that the temple must have been located there. Next, he claimed that he had found the remains of the temple at the Byzantine church of Ayos Cosmas. This small building is located just east of the center of the mountain on the central ridge, which makes it visible for most places in the southern half of the island. The church is a simple single aisled and vaulted building typical of churches found on Kithira. What distinguishes it from them, however, is the use of four Doric columns with their capitals that still support the vault of the church and on the exterior of the building, the large, mainly rectangular blocks clearly reused from ancient buildings. In his brief report, he doesn't provide a clear date for the temple, although he seems to place it in the seventh century based on its proximity to the fortifications of the same date. For many years, Schliemann's conclusions were taken for granted, but more recent appraisals have raised significant doubts not least the fact that the area where the church is located has not been leveled for a precinct and because it wouldn't have been visible from the harbor at Scandia. Also, an architectural study of the ancient blocks has concluded that they come from a small Doric building of the sixth century and that the four columns inside the church have no connection to this archaic building. Next. 20 seconds. So, Okay, so where is the temple of Aphrodite? The search for the temple continues, but perhaps it is not meant to be found, just like the goddess herself, an elusive mystery, keep it as hidden secret. Love it. All right, over, over, Sorry, to, you, over to you, Craig. 
Thank you very much. First slide. So whilst uh, you would uh, assume that if I am uh, choosing a site on Cyprus to uh, back up my claim, you would think that I would choose the sanctuary of Aphrodite Papia, Paleo Paphos of Puklia, as I've already described. With its now long period of excavations, intensive study by the University of Zurich, and clear architectural remains of both um, a late Bronze Age structure and its Roman period in particular structure following an earthquake associated with, uh, or during the reign of Vespasian. But instead, next slide please, I've decided to choose a different site and one perhaps a little closer to my own personal interest and my heart. The location of the theatre of Neopathos, again, where the University of Sydney has been excavating since 1995 and the project that I have the, the great privilege and honour to be the director of. It is built into the southern slope of a hill called Fabrica, located on the very northwestern corner of the Hellenistic city. And on the top of this hill, it has been long speculated that there was a temple dedicated to Aphrodite as well. The speculation is in large part because a description by Strabo in the second century AD, who talks about a temple dedicated to the goddess on the hill behind Paphos. Frustratingly, it's unclear in his description if he's referring to Paleopathos, which is where we know there's a temple dedicated to Aphrodite, or whether he's talking about the new settlement of Neopathos. But the reason why I chose this particular site is um, in reference to more recent archaeological work, but also to show the spread of the influence of Aphrodite beyond that sanctuary associated with her. At the very end of the fourth century BC, you have a massive series of political upheavals on the island and how that is manifest in uh, uh, the west coast of the island is the, according to one tradition, the last local king of Paphos, Nicobius II, moving the administrative capital of his kingdom from Paleopaphos to the nearby harbour of Paleopaphos, 14 kilometres away. And uh, uh, another version has the Ptolemies uh, upon seizing Cyprus doing this. It actually doesn't matter for our story the historical reality. The important thing is that it seems quite likely that Fabrica plays a very important role from the foundations of Neopathos, both for the establishment of the theatre as one of the very first public buildings and seemingly visible from this helicopter shot up on the very top left corner, you will see stone foundations of a structure which has long been speculated as perhaps being a temple. Um, the great... Uh, 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 um, scholar who's put forward this uh, argument over a number of decades now, Yolanta Malicic, the uh, archaeologist from the University of Warsaw, has in recent years been working with Claire Bellandier from the University of Avignon, excavating in this area. And indeed, they managed a very small season in 2001, despite the problems of COVID. And uh, next slide, please, if you don't mind, Candice. Um, I will come back to that one in just a moment, but uh, uh, just to say that uh, although they've yet to publish the results in any way, shape or form, um, I, uh, the, I've been given permission to tell you very excitingly that they have located what they believe to be a banqueting site adjacent to a monumental altar that they, at this point in time, and remember it's very early in the investigations, are claiming was in use from the second century BC until the middle of the second century AD. Now, only time will tell as they begin to publish their results how accurate that interpretation is. But you have seemingly the association of ritual feasting with some degree of building. The foundations, the bedrock foundations are all that remain of the actual building. How the temple, if indeed it was a temple, looks, we'll, we'll probably never really know. But if you wouldn't mind going back to the previous slide again, thank you very much, one minute. Um, what is interesting is that you'll see it's a large flat area that may well represent a terminos of some sort. And uh, the ceramic and other finds uh, being recovered from the excavations are suggesting that it's from the third century through until the middle of the second century. Now, this fits in quite significantly with the chronological development of the theatre itself. And I don't have time to go into details, but it seems to be that that site stops being used under the Antonines. And I have argued that we cannot um, see the theatre as a development in isolation from what has taken place elsewhere on Fabrica, that although Aphrodite is not directly associated with theatre, there must be some degree of understanding. 
I've also published elsewhere, and a lot of the research I'm doing at the moment is suggesting that there was a Severan temple constructed just to the west of the theatre, and that the Roman road that we are excavating to the south of the theatre, next slide please, is a significant, sorry, that one, is a significant connection, sorry, the next slide after that. 20 seconds. Apologies. Yeah, uh, a significant connection between Nea and Paleopapos, the pilgrim's route that becomes uh, an important uh, point of transportation or, or, or communication under the Roman period, but particularly under the Severans, where the imperial cult of the Severan emperors becomes associated with the Paphian Aphrodite cult. And we have, although the statues themselves don't survive, we have the honorary dedicatory inscriptions of a statue base found very close to the theatre in 1916 and constructed in 211 AD with Caracalla on top. And in the, my final slide, the matching statue of the emperor at Paleopapos, linking the cult city of antiquity with the contemporary bustling and sailor driven um, uh, port town of Neopapos. All right. And to wrap up our debate today, our final topic is legacy. Both Lita and Craig, another five minutes each. So off we go, Lita. Okay. Well, as mentioned earlier, the strong connection between Kithira and Aphrodite has been immortalized in popular and intellectual imagination, at least since the time of Hesiod and Homer, when the first Greek writings appear, and throughout the ages until the present day. Known as the Island of Love, virtually all of the earliest Western travelers to Greece connected Kithira with Aphrodite and also with Helen of, Par of Troy frequently focusing specifically on her abduction, abduction by Paris and their first night of romantic bliss on the island. This general fascination with the myths of Aphrodite and Helen of Troy in relation to Kithira probably stems from a literary tradition that dates back to the Hellenistic and Roman times that continued and developed further in the romantic, romantic literary atmosphere of the later Middle Ages and Renaissance in Western Europe. Next. Oh, actually leave it there, sorry. Sorry, go back, yeah. It is no coincidence therefore that the Venier family, the Venetian lords of Kithira since the 13th century, taking advantage of their family name, connect themselves directly with Aphrodite. After their conquest of Kithira, which in the Middle Ages is known as Tirigo, the Venier attempt to legitimize their claim of the island through their divine right as descendants of Venus, the Roman equivalent of the Greek Aphrodite. They ruled the island for 300 years, in which time Kithira's identity as the birthplace of Aphrodite was unquestionably cemented. From the Renaissance to the present, present, poets, philosophers, artists had imagined the island as inseparable from its goddess and the deep symbolism of their connection. Next slide. Theo Angelopoulos' 1984 film, Voyage to Kithira, is a love story and political allegory capitalizing on the island symbolism as idealized love that connects to abandonment, exile, and mel melancholy. Um, next, it is obvious that Angelopoulos is inspired by Charles Baudelaire. Um, next, and his 1857 poem of the same title, a poem that is quite dark and far from an ode of love and beauty. Next. So, um, so that's Baudelaire's poem right there. Um, 19, in the 1973 hit song, Kithira We Will Never Find, sung by the popular Greek singer Dimitris Mitropanos, also alludes to the elusiveness of the island. Next slide. So how did this connection between Kithira and Aphrodite, as it was imagined by local nobility and by foreign intellectuals and elites, impact the ordinary people of Kithira? To answer this, one must consider the island's rich folk tradition that survives up to the present day and which clearly defines the island in terms of its connection to the goddess of love. From poems and songs to legends and fairy tales, natural landmarks and features, there is an extensive repertoire of material that testifies to this. And while Kithirian folklore does include Cyprus in its narrative of Aphrodite's birth, it makes a point of Kithira being the first place where the goddess rises from the sea before the winds and waves transport her to her final destination in Cyprus. Some versions want her touching land on Kithira as soon as she is born, making the island all holy and sacred, while others want the island itself to be created upon her birth. Next slide. 
Small rocky islands near Kitira, like the two Dragonara Islands, are perceived to be cast the castrated members of Uranos that fell to sea. Uh, next. While the two symmetrical bays at Kapsali are thought to be the imprints of Aphrodite's breasts as they touch the ground after she came upon the island's shores. Next, the fascination with Aphrodite's breasts extends to the name given to a local variety of fruit, part peach, part apple, and quite delicious, that grows only in one area of the island, which happens to be close to where the ancient city of Kitira was located. Next, but beyond myth and folklore, one cannot ignore the real and deep spiritual connection between the people of Githra and their patron saint, the Mirtidyotisa, or Virgin of the Myrtle. The Mirtidyotisa, named after the icon of the Virgin that was found amongst the many myrtle bushes in the area, is revered by Githrians everywhere, who see her as the protector of the island, guarding them from centuries against pirate attacks, war, plague, disease, and famine. She performs miracles and helps women with conception and childbirth, and she's especially fond of children and protects them. She's the old holy of the island. And like Aphrodite, she says some significant characteristics, including a dark featureless face um, and the myrtle, also one of Aphrodite's symbols. Syncretism or not, it is hard not to imagine the passing on from the worship of one female patron to the island to another. You can put the last slide on. And thus the legacy of Aphrodite lives on. And if you ever visit Kithira, I assure you, her presence there will be immediately felt on the island's beaches, the mountains, the streams. And you may even hear her whisper to the winds and the rustling of leaves and the chirping of birds. Kithira is her island and Aphrodite is Kithira, one and the same. Amazing. Thank you, Lena. And Craig, for your last uh, pitch, please. Thank you, Candice, first slide. So whilst I'm tempted to use the Cyprus Tourist Organization's decade-long promotion um, of uh, uh, Love Cyprus or Cyprus as the Island of Love, and as a matter of interest, don't make the mistake of Googling Petro to Romeo and Bikini. Um, but uh, uh, in, in terms of the way that Cyprus has promoted itself uh, for a modern tourist audience, that connection with Aphrodite is centre. Indeed, uh, the Cyprus Tourist Organization very cleverly at one stage had a promotion tie-in with the reality TV series Love Island on the New Gate. Next slide, please. But what's interesting in many ways is the legacy of Cyprus's connection with, uh, uh, with um, Aphrodite in the modern world can be seen as something of a colonial legacy of Britain's uh, control of the island in the late 19th and early 20th century. The speakers of English language in particular emphasizes Aphrodite's connection with the island. Next slide, please. We see this through romantic fiction. I've not read this and I doubt I ever will, but uh, uh, just in terms of you know, some of the pulp fiction that was being produced in the post-war period when Cyprus was still a colony of Britain. And even uh, in a few decades later, next slide, please, in the popular 1979 BBC TV series, Aphrodite's Inheritance starring a typically understated performance by Brian Blessed and uh, Alexandra Bastillo, who we see here in the image, playing the uh, character of Helene, or is she Aphrodite herself? Filmed on location uh, in a number of archaeological sites on the island, uh, particularly around Paphos, Korean, and Nicosia, including the Tombs of the Kings, uh, Curion Theatre, and Petra II Romeo, of course. Uh, it was a hit series in the late 1970s. And if you don't know the show itself, you will certainly know its distinctive theme music if you have ever dined in a tourist taverna in Cyprus or in Greece. Next slide, please. However, the blessings of Aphrodite have also come with something of a curse. And this is particularly uh, demonstrable in the 18th and 19th century early travelers' accounts. And it is in particular in reference to something that Lita mentioned before as well, which is the idea of the association of sacred prostitution or temporal, prostit temporal prostitution associated with Aphrodite. The most famous account of it is Herodotus who describes it as a Babylonian custom but on display of the temple of Aphrodite in Paphos in which girls prior to marriage would offer themselves for sex uh, within the temple under the rites of Aphrodite herself. 
Uh, similar claims are made by other ancient sources, including Ovid. Apart from a temple, Echition um, lists sacred prostitutes alongside other ritual uh, personnel employed by the temple or offered by the temple, including bakers and barbers. But the role of this concept, I think, has taken on, and, and many scholars would argue, has taken on something of a very misconstrued view in the modern world. And this has been the subject of a number of reviews, including some papers in the Engendering Aphrodite Conference of 20 years ago, and a lot of work conducted by Rita Severus, the curator of the Centre for Visual Arts and Research. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Amelia. Um, and uh, 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 Rita, in particular, has gone through a number of travellers' accounts um, that are striking by their misogyny. Um, references such as a priest from Westphalia visiting Paphos in 1341, talking about how sleeping on the soils of Cyprus, that if a man slept thereon uh, of its own self, will all the night through provoke a man to lust. Um, later, and particularly notable in the 18th and 19th centuries, as I mentioned before, because unlike many other parts of the Ottoman Empire, uh, Cyprian women, and particularly Paphian women, did not wear, uh, did not cover their masks. Um, we have uh, references from writers, um, both uh, expressing uh, very much for the male gaze, but also very much a disappointment that the idea of uh, the beauty of the descendants of, of, of Aphrodite being very much disappointing to their uh, particular perspectives and some shocking descriptions such as, uh, I confess that putting aside the conventional style which I notice about modern women, perhaps the, uh, the result perhaps of the depression and stupor of their political position, their round and expressionless faces, their loose bottoms and their awkward gait do not give one a favourable idea of the much vaunted beauty of their ancestors. And an English traveller of 1827, thank you, who uh, says, God knows how this island ever attained its celebrity for beauty. To judge of it from the specimens we saw, one would have said it was the last place in which Venus would have chosen to fix her favourite residence. Next slide, please. It is a shameful legacy. However, again, Paphos is at the center of a lot of artistic depictions of the goddess, both through romantic images, such as this famous work in the Museum of the USA. Next image, please. And through to much more modern works. Um, and, and indeed, the goddess herself in the next slide was reunited with Paphos with this sculpture unveiled in time for Paphos hosting the European Capital of Culture in 2017, yet again, coming ashore on the coast of southern Cyprus. But I'm going to leave my final words to a man who knew a fair amount, a fair amount about the human condition of love, of desire, and of beauty. Final slide, please, Candice. William Shakespeare's narrative poem, Venus and Adonis of 1593, leaves us in no doubt that Shakespeare himself, holding their course to Paphos, where their queen means to immure herself and not be seen, that Paphos is the home of Aphrodite, and she is hidden, but she is always there. Wonderful. So that wraps up our debate for this evening. Um, thank you both so very much. I think you've both cast some very interesting and unexpected arguments to be the birthplace of Aphrodite. Uh, for everyone in the audience, I'm going to open the poll now in which you can have your vote as to where you think uh, the birthplace of Aphrodite is. Uh, and I'll hand over to Amelia for her official adjudication and I'll stop the screen sharing at the same time. All right, thank you so much, Candice, for inviting me to adjudicate this fascinating debate. Thank you to Lita and thank you to Craig for your impassioned, thoughtful and well-reasoned um, uh, summaries of the legacies, artifacts, and sites of these two islands and their relations with Aphrodite. I wanted to go back, back to the very beginning, back to Hesiod and Hesiod's Theogony, uh, and uh, to give, you know, the support to Kithra that uh, in the Theogony, Kithra is mentioned first. It says uh, in the translation of the Greek, of Hesiod's Theogony lines uh, 188 to 200. First, she drew near Holy Kithara, and it, it also, um, when he moves on to speak of her name and why she is called Aphrodite, it is because she is Aphrogania, she's born from the foam, and uh, she is also called Kitharia because she reached Kithara. 
So those are the ways in which Hesiod uh, prioritizes the Catharian origin. And to, for him, it was uh, doubtless um, obvious and clear and something to be played around with poetically, but also something you know, that was an essential element of his cultural tradition that uh, Aphrodite was also Catharia. However, in that same passage of the Theogony, he does mention right after Kithara, uh, from there, she came to Seagirt Cyprus. She came forth an awful and lovely goddess and grass grew up about her beneath her shapely feet. So she didn't come ashore in Kithara in the poetic tradition. It uh, was at Cyprus that she stepped ashore and there where she made things to grow. And I've been thinking a lot about Aphrodite. Why does she make things grow? It's uh, uh, not just her beauty, her sexuality, uh, her promotion of intercourse, but also her rain, her water that she provides uh, that uh, allows the plants to grow, whether on very hot and dry Cyprus or on very uh, hot and dry Kithara. Uh, and I wanted to mention finally that uh, as uh, Hesiod continues in the, uh, uh, this uh, saying that gods and men call her Aphrodite, Aphrogenia, Kitharia, uh, because she reached Kithara, she was also Kiprogenia, born of Cyprus, uh, born of Polyclisto, very billowy Cyprus, uh, Cyprus out in the middle of the sea. Uh, and there, uh, I think uh, that the fact that Cyprus is this very important Eastern island, it's a much larger island than Kithara, but it's also uh, filled with uh, better harbors and uh, it's on the routes between Greece and the East. Whereas Kithara, Kithara is on the routes from Laconia to Crete, uh, from Greece to other parts of Greece. It's certainly a place that Odysseus had to uh, pass by and had to try and get back to. Um, but uh, it was Cyprus that was the, the island that was harder to avoid. <laughs> and so from my, my not entirely, um, you know, fair place here uh, at, uh, at Corinth, uh, and thanks to Lita for this lovely photo of Corinth in the snow, as it is right now, uh, uh, from my, uh, my seat in Queensland, but uh, uh, in imagination at Corinth, uh, I have to just very slightly let the balance fall towards Cyprus uh, and say that uh, I, I would vote for Cyprus. Um, but, uh, but thank you both so much. <laughs> and thank you, Amelia. I appreciate uh, your academic opinion and thoughtful arguments. However, we also have our uh, poll finished. And I can say that 20% of our audience uh, we're undecided, so that's good to know. <laughs> and then um, I hope that people can see the poll result. Uh, but Kithra has won with 46% of the vote, and Cyprus has what, uh, come in second at 34% of our fabulous vote. So thank you both very much for this fabulous uh, evening. Congratulations, Lita, on your popular vote win. Congratulations, <laughs> Craig, on your uh, academic Congratulations, vote Lita, too, on your wonderful book about Kithara, which I think uh, everyone would learn uh, an enormous amount from, uh, and I cherish and treasure my copy of. Uh, but Thank you, Amelia, for Craig, promoting it. <laughs> so that Craig doesn't feel left out, I also have to <laughs> mention his excellent uh, um, uh, book from a few years ago on the, the fantastic exhibition at the Nicholson Collection, now the Chao Chak Wing Museum, on Aphrodite's Island. Uh, the Cypriot materials in that museum. Thank you, Amelia. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, everybody. And thank you, especially Alita, who has braved a snowstorm to come out tonight as well. Or today. So I very much it's appreciate it. really cool. <laughs> yes, ignore the background. It's really not what's happening right <laughs> now. <laughs> it's quite cold. Uh, Indeed. So thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, that's the end of our evening today. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, sticking around for this wonderful debate and hopefully we will debate some more myths and legends uh, from Greek and Roman history as we go through. So thank you everybody.